There are more than 30 million Kurds, most of them living in an overlapping area of Iraq, Iran, Syria, and Turkey. It's said to be the biggest ethnic community in the world without a homeland. In some of the countries they live in, they're prevented from speaking their language or obtaining citizenship. Saddam Hussein used chemical weapons against the Kurds, destroyed their villages, and killed tens of thousands of them during his rule. The bodies are still being unearthed. The U.S. encouraged them to rise up against Saddam when his forces were driven out of Kuwait in 1991, but then left them hanging. Thousands died fleeing to Turkey as refugees. But the no-fly zone the Americans, British and French established to protect them from Saddam's attacks allowed them to break away from Iraqi government authority while remaining part of Iraq. Since 2003, the Kurdish region has become the most stable and most prosperous part of the country. That prosperity has been fueled by oil and by Turkish investment. While relations with Turkey have improved, they've worsened with Baghdad with disagreements over oil, land and politics that some fear could turn violent. Kurdish President Masoud Barzani has emerged as a crucial player in Iraqi politics and the leader of Kurdish aspirations in the region. He's warned that Iraq's Kurds could seek independence if they don't get what they need from Baghdad and that his region won't be dragged down by the rest of Iraq. Now, on Talk to Al Jazeera, we sit down with the Kurdish president to find out how far he's willing to go to protect and promote the interests of the Kurdish people. President Barzani, thank you so much for talking to Al Jazeera. Now, this region has been through two wars, sanctions, fighting inside, tax from outside. It seems more powerful and certainly more autonomous than it's ever been. But do you still feel that you're in a struggle for survival? There's no doubt that the Kurdish question has made a lot of progress, but I cannot deny that we still face a lot of challenges. I can, however, definitely say that the Kurds have passed the stage where their survival could be threatened. It would be impossible for us as a people to accept having to give up everything we have achieved. There's a real crisis going on in Iraq, and you warned just a few months ago that if it continues, that the Kurdish region could seek its independence. Are you still prepared to follow through on that? If I can make clear what exactly it is that I said, it's this, that Iraq is facing a serious and genuine crisis, and we have two kinds of problems. One is a general problem for Iraq as a whole, and the other is problems between the Kurdish region and Baghdad. We've called for genuine reform for the problems, the Iraqi-wide problems, and also the ones between the Kurdish region and Baghdad. I call upon the Iraqi leaders if they are ready and willing to come and talk to us. We are ready to do whatever we can to help solve these problems. If the other Iraqi factions are not ready to follow us, then I will go back to the Kurdish people and ask them to decide what needs to be done. And I'm still saying the same thing. And do you feel now, given that there hasn't really been much progress between Baghdad and Erbil, do you feel now that you will go to the Kurdish people in September and ask them in a referendum whether they want independence? Frankly speaking, the current situation is not acceptable, and we will not allow it to continue. Our people cannot tolerate it, and I'm sure the Iraqi people will not accept it either. Certainly, at some point, I will go back to the people, but I'd first have to consult with the political parties in the region. I have to consult with Parliament. This is not a decision for me to make alone. But certainly, the moment we feel disappointed and lose hope of solving the problems and getting out of this crisis, then I will go back to the people. But before that, I have to consult with the political groups here and with Parliament. There has been an attempt for some months now to actually have a vote of no confidence in Prime Minister Maliki. It seems to have failed.
Do you hold out any hope that he could be replaced in the next two years before the next elections? The process has not stopped, and the issue of questioning the Prime Minister in Parliament will continue. This seems to have become quite personal. You helped Prime Minister Maliki form a unity government. In fact, you helped him become Prime Minister, and there seems to be a feeling that he has betrayed your trust. How much of this is personal between Prime Minister Maliki and yourself, given the history over the last two years? I will not, under any circumstances, let the problem become personal. Of course, I had a lot of trust in Prime Minister Maliki because of our long-standing relationship. I've lost hope in him as a result of what has happened. I sometimes thought at meetings, if Maliki were here instead of me, he would defend the Kurds the way I did. But unfortunately, instead of that, the first opportunity that he had in 2008, he ordered in the tanks against the Kurdish people. That was in Kanakin. When he did that, that was when I started losing trust in him. There does seem to be a military buildup. There's tension along the de facto border between the Kurdish region and Iraq. You've talked about fears of Iraq having F-16s, what are you doing on your side to ensure that the Kurdish region is secure? Actually for us, F-16s are no different to MiG-19s or MiG-21s. We've seen them being used against us. We've seen tanks, artillery and other weapons being used against our people. We've seen large numbers of troops being used against our people. That is not what we're afraid of. What we fear is the mentality that still believes in using planes, artillery and tanks to solve the problems. We do not believe that that will solve the problem. That's the wrong approach. And the misery and the troubles that Iraq faces today are a result of that kind of thinking. So we do not want that to be repeated. Otherwise, if Baghdad or the federal government think about the usage of such things, then we will be obliged to go back to the times when we had to think about how to target the F-16s so that they wouldn't reach us. We hope that that will not be the case, but we have to prepare ourselves. Can you just expand a little bit more on that, on measures that would not allow their F-16s to target you? Are you, in fact, in the process of improving air defenses? Are you taking such measures? We would do all we possibly could to stop the situation getting to that point. We want to ensure that there will be a return of balance to the Iraqi army, that there will be an Iraqi army for all Iraqis to defend all of Iraq and the Iraqi people, and not to use it against the Iraqi people or any portion of Iraq or any place or any region in Iraq. This will be our strategy and this will be our policy and we hope we will succeed. If we are not successful, then there is no doubt that it is our right to f follow whatever approach and whatever means we can find in order to protect Kurdistan and the Kurdish people from any attacks from F-16s or any other source. You've made amazing strides in relations with Turkey. Turkey is now the economic lifeline of the Kurdish region. But still, there are concerns in Turkey, of course, of growing Kurdish power. Do you believe that Turkey would allow a Kurdish region that is not just economically more powerful, but militarily more powerful? <laughs> I believe that the Kurdish region has shown itself ready and willing to have good economic relations with all of our neighbours, and there has certainly been significant progress in our relations with Turkey. As our economic relationship progresses, any fears they may have in other areas will diminish. With regard to the military strengthening of the Kurdistan region, this is something of great importance to the Kurdish people and the region itself and we will not allow anyone else to interfere. It is about defending the region and the people of the region. Oil now is very much a question. Baghdad has threatened to cut off some of the revenue that it gives to the Kurdish region. The Kurdish region says it's exporting crude oil to Turkey. 
one of Prime Minister Maliki's advisors has warned that things like this could actually lead to armed conflict. Where does this stop? It is clear that some people in Baghdad do not harbor any goodwill towards the people of Kurdistan, and they are simply hostile to the Kurdistan region. This is not a legal or constitutional issue. They simply want to stop progress in the Kurdistan region. And this is our conviction. Actually, none of the contracts we have signed have gone against the Constitution. In the 2007 oil and gas law draft, there was a proposal that was prepared. It was supposed to go to Parliament, and there were annexes that said that if until May of that year the law did not pass in the Iraqi Parliament, then both sides could continue signing contracts. They were the reason behind the law not going to Parliament. And the only question is this, why didn't they allow the law to pass in Parliament? I'm not saying that we're correct in everything we have done or everything we say. There may be some issues on our side as well. But let's sit down and talk. Let's look at it. We have not done anything contrary to the Constitution. All of it has followed the Constitution. However, the moment we find any area in which we violated the Constitution, we are happy to admit it and remedy it. But whatever we see at the moment, it's just hostility towards Kurdistan, and that's being used as an excuse. Instead of having this kind of animosity against us, they should respond to the Iraqi people. They've spent $27 billion on the electricity sector. Can they explain to the Iraqi people what has happened to that money? Look at it and ask the people what is going on with the electricity sector in the rest of the country. Let them respond to these questions and spend their energy on that instead of on hostility and working against the Kurdish people. They should expend their efforts providing services to the people of Iraq. Now, I would say the best way forward would be for talks to continue so that we get the oil and gas law passed in Parliament. The moment it passes, that will be the great chance for problems to be resolved. In contrast, if we wait for a personal decision by someone in Baghdad, that will not help. And of course, cutting the budget for the region from Baghdad, that we would consider as a declaration of war. And Baghdad would be held responsible for whatever consequences follow. What does that mean if they do cut the budget and you do consider it a declaration of war? What does that mean? What's the next step? The moment they cut the budget, that would be considered a declaration of war. It's obvious when you say there's a declaration of war. It's obvious what that entails. It's premature to talk about that now. But certainly the moment they were to do that, then we would consider it a declaration of war. And it's obvious what that means. I don't think there's a need to go into details. To most people, a declaration of war would mean that you get your fighters, you get your weapons, and it starts armed conflict. Is that what we're talking about? There are many options. That is not the only option. Can the Kurdish region survive economically if Iraq did cut the budget through oil exports to Turkey or other places? This situation will not remain. It will not continue like this. Does that mean that... The question is, can the whole of Iraq remain like that or not? And that is a good question, because we're seeing increasing attempts at autonomy in the Sunni provinces, some of them in the south. Will Iraq hold together? We are not talking about the old Iraq. We have contributed and are partners in building this new Iraq. The new Iraq should be ruled jointly. And also, there has to be a partnership, a real partnership in this country. It is not about one individual or one group ruling the country. That is exactly what the problem is in Iraq today. It is the problem of one-man rule and the imposition of centralized rule. So, I do not believe that even Iraqis will accept that. Neither the Shias nor the Sunnis will accept the current situation. And it is not the case that with this crisis, a single group would be able to lead Iraq towards an unknown future. That is not something the rest of the Iraqi people will accept. I don't believe they will accept this kind of approach, that someone imposes his will.
So either we have a genuine partnership in this country, or the people of Iraq, the Shias and the Sunnis, will not accept the current situation. In the Kurdish region these days, young people don't speak Arabic, they don't learn it in school. You have your own economy, your own services, you even pretty much control the borders. What is there still that ties the Kurdish region to Iraq? Of course, Arabic is the official language in the country and in the region. And the Arabic language is studied here in the region. That is a continuation of the policies of the last 30 years. And just to correct your information, Arabic is being studied here in schools in Kurdistan. As far as the second part of your question is concerned, that is precisely the reality and the truth that we want to be considered and we want people to be convinced of. Iraq is two main nationalities, Arabs and Kurds, and we have decided this on the basis of a voluntary union. So this is the fact and the truth. If we want it to be recognized and accepted. The moment we are recognized and accepted, there will be no problem. You know, a few weeks ago, we watched you lower the coffin of one of the Kurdish victims of Saddam Hussein's Anfal campaign into the ground, one of tens of thousands still in mass graves. How much has that affected the history of this region? This is, of course, a deep wound. We will never forget that. I'm very proud of being one individual among the Kurdish people because our people have had their suffering and pain and they don't think about retaliation or revenge after all the tragedies that have happened to them. As far as I'm concerned, the remains of that martyr, I don't know if he was a man or she was a woman, was it a child, a son, a boy or a girl? I had a very strange feeling, and probably this was the first time in my life I had that feeling. But I thought he was my brother, he was my son, she was my mother, she was my daughter. It was a strange feeling. For me, I'd never felt it before. It really touched me. You've talked about training Syrian Kurds who have come from Syria, training them to go back in. What do you think is the effect of some of the regions in the Kurdish areas of Syria having fallen to opposition fighters? What are we looking at here? Is it a country that will hold together? What is the future of the Kurds in Syria? And how does that affect Kurds in the region? Of course they are our brothers, but the situation for the Syrian Kurds is different to other areas. They were deprived of the basic right of citizenship. They did not have state identity. They were considered refugees or infiltrators. They were deprived of the basic rights of citizenship. So the training that's taken place is not for fighting. The training is just a precautionary measure. So the moment the situation collapses in Syria, once there is a vacuum there to enable them to play a role, to make sure there are no transgressions against the Kurdish people. Certainly, we want to see a change in the Kurdish situation in Syria, but that is something for them to decide upon. It's their role, and we believe that they can play a positive role, and they have played a positive role, in order to build a new Syria that will be democratic and pluralistic. We believe it's important that they are part of it. It's their right. And for all the Syrian people to enjoy a better future, and for the Kurdish people to enjoy their rights in Syria. You've talked about hosting a regional conference of Kurds here sometime this year. That would be an extraordinary step, possibly the most important, the biggest gathering of Kurds in the region. Do you feel with everything going on in the region, the Arab Spring, the changes going through, are you on the verge of creating a more powerful Kurdish community across the borders? The purpose behind the conference is for the Kurds to have a united statement, a statement that stresses peace and peaceful coexistence, and also attempts to solve our problems in a peaceful and democratic way. That's the purpose behind it. 
you've been betrayed at some point, the Kurdish region as a whole, by pretty much everyone, by the Americans in 1991 when they did not immediately come to your aid, by Turkey, by the surrounding countries. Who do you trust? Who are your allies? Of course the world has changed. But before anything else, we believe in God and we believe in our people. If we are not there ourselves as a people, then even if others are ready to help us, we will not be able to achieve that. Here in the Kurdish region, there are some concerns that the democracy that you were aiming for hasn't quite taken hold. Elections here, provincial elections were to have been held, have been delayed. When will those take place and how do you respond to the criticisms that this is not a democratic region? I was against the delay of the provincial elections. In fact, when Parliament, the government and the independent commission in Baghdad told us that for technical reasons they can't be held and had to be delayed, I accepted that. Otherwise, I am against that decision and I support holding provincial elections. This region has had a, a tragic history on, on many levels, and part of that tragedy has been Kurds fighting Kurds inside the region. In the 1990s, uh, the other major Kurdish faction appealed to Iran for help, and you appealed to the Iraqi government, to Saddam Hussein's forces, to help drive them out of Erbil. Is there anything about that part of the past that you regret? First, in my capacity as president of the region, I am proud, and that has been one of the main aims in accepting this responsibility, in order to make sure that this internal Kurdish fighting will not happen again. We will do whatever we can in order to remove that, and I am proud to make sure it will never happen again. It was a very unfortunate thing, and we would not have wanted that to happen. In fact, we are not alone in suffering from such a thing. Other people have also suffered. This was a stage we passed through. It was very unfortunate and very sad. We hope we have put it behind us and it will never happen again. And I have no objection if the Kurdish people want to investigate and look into this fighting, how it happened and why and how it came about. Do you feel there's a gap between what the younger generation want, what they demand, in fact, and the older generation who have lived through all these tragedies? Some of the younger generation, for instance, believe it's the time is over for family members to be the heads of the National Security Council, for instance. Is there something in those concerns? Is there, is there a gap between the young people and the older ones? Of course, people have all the right to say what they believe in, and everybody is free, whichever way they think. But let them look at the results. Look at the stability and security of the Kurdistan region. The new generation, the old generation, whoever is a resident of the Kurdistan region. Are the people prosperous and happier with all the violence that's been inflicted upon the rest of Iraq? The Kurdistan region was kept free of such kinds of violence. What we have in terms of security and stability has been hard to achieve. It has not come without any efforts. These are the results of the working of certain people who have been successful in accomplishing their duties. These people have to be appreciated for what they've done. Of course, any change that's possible here in the region, but certainly we in the Kurdish regional government are making sure that we build a state of institutions and institutions will be running this region. But in this respect, I would ask people to look at the results, to look at the outcome, and to look at the stability and security of the region, and not just throw words around. You've been such an essential part of the history of not just the Kurdish region, but the Kurdish people regionally. How would you like your legacy to be seen? As far as I'm concerned, I have a clear conscience, as I have done whatever I've been able to do for the sake of our people. From my childhood, I've done everything in order to succeed in freeing our people and liberating our land. The judgment will be left to the people. And is the region ready for an independent Kurdistan? It's a natural right for the people, but the question of when it will be ready and how it will be ready, that's a different question. President Barzani, thank you so much for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you.